Today's message is going to be, I'm going to be talking on first steps in your land of promise. What are the first steps you are supposed to take when you get to your land of promise? Now, let's assume that your land of promise is the entertainment world. So any, any uh, calling that you have, any mountain that you are supposed to conquer for God, any sphere of influence that you are supposed to get for God, let's assume that God gave you an employment there or you, you managed to get into that territory. What do you begin to do? Because if you don't know the steps that you are supposed to take, you'll be confused. And that's why we say that people go into politics and get lost. Because, okay, they know they are called to politics, but when they get there, <laughs> they see all new things, all kind of things happening, and they don't know what to do. They don't know how to behave themselves. So that's why I'm dealing with this topic. What are, going to, what are your first steps supposed to be when you get to your land of promise? What are the first things you're supposed to deal with? Um, the first thing that you're supposed to do, you know, is first of all, you must come there with a plan. <laughs> you must first of all come there to your, your promised land with a vision, with a plan. Uh, so, you know, wherever, wherever God is calling you to, make sure that before you get there, you have studied everything about that promised land. Let's say God is asking you to go to politics or to go and bring his influence, his kingdom to the political world. You must start by, you know, first of all, studying and doing due diligence <coughs> over yourself. You must go and study and, uh, and uh, everything regarding the political life of that particular society. So, before you could be effective in your promised land, you must make sure that you study everything before you get there. Number, th number two thing that you need to do, you need to make sure that you come up with the experiences of other people who have been successful in that land of promise. If it is entertainment world, look for good examples of people who have been in the entertainment world. Research them. Let's say you are going to be in the entertainment world in Great Britain. Check Hollywood. Check out America and see uh, or other countries where they have had uh, good entertainment, good influence in entertainment and see who are the best examples in that sphere of, life, of influence. And what are the things you could learn from them? If you are called to the world of politics, let's say in Africa, uh, look into those countries where they've had, you know, successful political experiences, and especially where they where they've had Christians uh, as politicians. Study the lifestyle of those politicians. Study their principles, their their laws, the laws that they have enacted, and. Um, you know, get an experience from there. So put up your own plan in accordance to the, make sure you, you know, you get your, your, you learn from the experiences of those people, of people who have been successful where you are going. And uh, compare your plans to the plans of people who have been successful because you must know what to do when you get to your promised land. I remember that here in Ukraine, uh, we started three political parties in our church, and one of the political parties won the municipal uh, election. And the, 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 one of our brothers in the church became the governor of the capital, or the mayor of the capital, because they won the, we won the election. And they actually won in a landslide. They, we won 34% uh, of, the, of the parliament, of the municipal uh, uh, council of our city of the capital of Ukraine, but even despite the fact that we control the parliament of the city, and this, despite the fact that you know we our guy was the mayor and the governor of the capital, uh, but 
he was so overwhelmed by the amount of corruption, malpractices, and all the things that have been done wrong in that, in that uh, particular sphere, that even though he had been in politics himself before then, like for 10 years, he was so overwhelmed that he almost fell into depression. Because when you are not prepared for what you are about to see, you could, even though you are a Christian and you have good intentions and you want to do you know, good things for the country, uh, then you, you could be so much overwhelmed that you might say, you might be tempted to say, well, I think this thing is not for me. Or I think darkness is stronger than light. And right now, Walter Dunford is saying, wow, is, it, is there a point, sir? Is there a point? <laughs> okay. For me, as an individual, if, or for you as an, as an individual, maybe in the national you could think, yeah, there is no point. But when you begin to think that whatever we do on the earth, we are not doing for our interest. We are not here to live for ourselves. That's a good point. Is there any point in going to confront the principalities and powers when you could live a peaceful life? Is there any point when you could go into why you should go into politics when indeed you could you know just live your own life and enjoy your life? Is there what's the point? Is there any point to go into the world of the business and uh, where there will be a lot of controversies and a lot of deceptions and and then you have to be always coming up with ta tactics and uh, strategies of how to overcome. Is there any point? Well, if you are going to think about yourself as an individual, then there is no point. But also, we are not called to live for ourselves. We don't live for ourselves. We, we were saved for, to live for him. We were saved that we would no longer be the Lord and the Savior of our We will not, no longer be the Lord of our lives. We will no longer be the ones on the throne of our lives. If the whole essence of salvation is for us to be like him, to be like Jesus. And what was Jesus like like? Jesus' life was such that he was in a comfortable place already. He was in a wonderful place already. He was in heaven. And in heaven, there is no Satan there. There is no sin, no temptation there. And, and, uh, but he left the kingdom of God. He left heaven and came to the earth. So that he will, even though things will be difficult here for him on the earth, even though he knew he would be killed here on the earth, even though, you know, he was going to become ordinary man here on the earth. But that is what mission is all about. That is what purpose of living is all about. You must fulfill the agenda of the heart of the Father. So Jesus left the comfortable heaven and came to the earth where he had to suffer and pay the price to glorify and, and, um, and, and live for God and please the heart of God. That our, our life is to live for God, but living for God is not going to church and sing. Living for God is not just reading the Bible and praying in your room. Living for God is bringing His will to pass on the earth. Living for God is doing what pleases Him. To live for God is to fulfill His agenda for your life. To live for God is to find out why He created you, what He created you for, and what are the things he wants you to do? What are the things he wants you to accomplish while you are here on the earth? So living for God really is not just being religious. Living for God is not just, you know, living a life whereby, you know, you just go to church, you don't do anything. No, living for God really is, you know, becoming an instrument in the hand of God, becoming an instrument by which God returns and restores his dominion and his lordship and his kingdom upon the earth, so that his kingdom and his lordship will reign over the earth. Now, living for God means you know, going out from the four walls of the church, going to confront all the forces of darkness that have been holding God's territory, God's you know, land, or God's earth under their own dominion, and you know, you know, take it over, from the forces of darkness and bring the glory of God to that place. Now, you say to glorify God. We glorify God only when we fulfill his, his will and desires. We glorify God only when we make our environment, our sphere of calling, our area of influence to glorify him. We only glorify God when we subdue the earth to God. 
when we bring the glory of the earth to God. You see, every territory, every sphere of influence has got its own glory. The Bible says there is a different glory to the sun, there is a different glory uh, to the moon, there is a different glory to, you know, to all creation. Every creation, every sphere of life has its own glory. And the question is that that glory must be submitted to God. So that's why we are called. We are the children of God. We are the sons of God. We are supposed to be manifested to manifest God's glory and God's, you know, you know, you know bring God's glory to, from those uh, other uh, sections of creation by going there and subduing and causing those spheres of influence to live by the principles of God, to live by the righteousness of God, to live by the, the principles of the scriptures. So it is when we cause, for example, the word of engineering to worship God or for the principles of God to reign in that world of engineering, that is when the glory of the engineering world is given to God. That's why we give glory. We subdue that place and we give that place its glory to God. When we cause the environment to, to be in order, in the kind of order that God wants us to be, that is how we bring, bring the glory of the environment to God. When we cause a nation or a city to worship God, to bow before the Lord Almighty, that is how we bring the glory of that nation to the Lord. So bringing glory to God means, for example, uh, if, uh, if, if, let's say, uh, Steve Jobs, you know, dedicates his, his, his product uh, I, uh, I, uh, Apple, pro, uh, uh, Apple products to glorify God. That is how we bring the glory of the engineering world, of the computer or uh, smart smart uh, phones uh, world to, to, to God. So you, we glorify God when we cause the, His creation to glorify Him. We glorify God when we cause His creation to obey Him. We glorify God when we make His creation to be obedient to His word. Because sometimes we think that we glorify God only when we sing in the church. We think that we only glorify God when we go to the church and sing songs. No, uh, that is one way of glorifying God. But God wants us to glorify Him in our deeds, in our actions, through our talents, through our abilities, through uh, the potential and the giftings and the you know, calling that He has put in us. Alright? Now, so what are the first steps that you take when you enter into the territory that you feel that God is taking you to. First of all, like I, like I said, you must make sure that you do a thorough research and, you know, about the, all the problems of that country, of, of that territory that you have been called to minister to. So if it is a, in the sphere of education in your city or in your country, if God is asking you to, to take care of the sphere of education, you must study that whole sphere and know everything about that educational sphere. And then you must find out what their problems are. You must find out what are the problems that the educational sphere or ministry in your country is confronting or facing. You must also find out what are the problems that the students are facing. What are the problems that the uh, teachers, professors are facing. What are the challenges with the curriculum? You must, you, because the, the devil is in the details. You must go into the details and find out everything about education in that country. Once you have done that, you must have, in, in, just uh, you, when you have a list of all the problems, on the opposite of those, that each problem, you must prefer, have a prefer solution. You must do another research to, okay, let's say the problem is that the curriculum, you must do a research of what are the best curriculum curricula uh, in the world and, and uh, how can you adopt them to fit and to address the problem of curriculum deficiency in your own country. So a problem and then investigation and you come up with a solution. Same also if you find out the problem is with the uh, discipline of the students, you must then go into research and find out how are problems of discipline being resolved in other countries? Then you get the best practices, and those best practices you adopt it to your own country, and then you have an answer for that. Then just the same way you address every problem and prefer an equal solution or corresponding solution to that problem. So when you now come into that land of promise, you have come prepared. 
you have come prepared, but it's not just enough to be prepared. You must I mean, to be prepared like that in, in paper and in theory. It's also necessary for you to find out the experience of other Christians who have been successful. Or maybe who, people who are not Christians, but people who have been the most successful individuals like you. People who have been reformers. People who have been sons of God. Uh, sons in that sphere of influence. People who have you know, had some track record. People who have been able to bring change. People who have been saviors and deliverers. Not just in your own country, but all over the world. What are the things that uh, this person has done that, has, that gave him this amount of success or that has made him to be able to have the influence or the success or the change that he was able to have you know, in that particular uh, sphere of influence. So the same thing could be in the world of uh, politics, entertainment, uh, education, media, just anything. Don't just go, don't just say, oh, God has called me, I believe it, and in the name of Jesus, we are going to conquer the land. You must be prepared as well. It's one thing to believe God that you are going to conquer. That is the spiritual realm. That is the faith realm. That is one aspect of preparation. But for you to really take care, take care of your promised land, for you to really be effective in that promised land, you must also be prepared intellectually. You must be prepared mentally. You must be prepared in every sphere of influence. You must be prepared for professional. And the thing that is needed is solution. Everybody is looking for solution. You know, no matter where you are and no matter what sphere of life God is calling you to, there are challenges there. There are problems there. And you need to you know, do a thorough investigation about the problems of that particular uh, sphere of life. So telling you about the example of my, of my members that went into politics. Uh, so the mayor... So the mayor... Um, uh, discovered that you know there were so many problems in the in the in the politics that he inherited that he couldn't believe it and and but the major problem with him was not even with the managing the city or the capital and uh, fixing the problem of the capital but the problem he had was that if you are a mayor or the governor of the, of the federal capital you must be submitted to the authority above you and the authority above him, in this sense, was the prime minister, uh, sometimes the ministers, and uh, but most of the time the president, the president, the prime minister, all that. And sometimes what happens is that you find out that some of these people are corrupt too, and because they are corrupt and you are under them, they demand from you things that you have to do. And since they are your boss, it's like you cannot refuse them. So that kind of situation. Is another is also important to investigate and do research on how to come out of that kind of situation, how to answer uh, in that kind of pressure, and how to escape that kind of pressure. Now, the easiest thing to do would have been what my brother just what I just wrote here. Maybe it's not worth it. Maybe we just you know get out of the place anyway. We just come out of that politics and leave it for the unbelievers. Well, that is what we have done so far. That is what the whole world has been doing. We have been leaving the world and the spheres of influence and the mountains of culture and the you know, structure of the society. We've been leaving them in the hands of all the unbelievers. And then we just leave and go. And what has happened as, is that the, Satan has taken over our world. Uh, the whole world is being run by Satan and by unbelievers. And the world is not getting better. And so if we're, whenever you are retreating, and you are refusing to advance and to uh, to, be, to go on the offensive. If you, if if you don't go on the offensive and you are retreating, you are not gaining ground when you are retreating. When you are not you are not gaining territory, you are actually losing territory. And what you will discover is that the system of the world is running you over, and you think you are hiding in the church, and that if we will only stay in the church, we will escape from the pressure of the world. But what happens really is that in the church. You, 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 you are not saved because the culture of the church, of the world will be coming over to overwhelm you. 
the culture and the pressure from the society will now be coming to attack the church so much that the church will now be, uh, you know, be not just on the defensive, but the church will now be losing ground and losing its influence and territory. And the church, before they know it, will begin to copy the lifestyle of the people of the world. So this is what happens when we retreat. When we retreat, the lifestyle of the world begin to overrun us. And the people in the church, even who are your members, they will begin to now copy and begin to adapt to the system of the world instead of the world adapting to the standard of the kingdom of God. That is why we don't say, well, uh, you know, since it's too difficult in the in the secular world to take all these mountains and those spheres of influence like politics, like other places, that then we have to just back out and just, you know, stay where we are and behave and don't go and touch them. That, that means you are, you are falling back. You are being going to the defensive. You are retreating. And when you are retreating, first of all, you are not fulfilling the call of God upon your life, which is take back territories for God, to restore back the earth to God, which is which means you know you know advance the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not advancing; its righteousness is not growing. You know, and then you are not even taking territories. Instead of you taking territories, you are losing territories, and that is what we've been doing. That is what the church has been doing over the years. And that's why the church, a new church must arise, a church that is more proactive, a church that goes on the offense. Like I said yesterday, the power that God gave us is it, the power to, 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 to go on the offense, is the power to attack. So the church must always be advancing. The church must always be going on the offensive. If we don't go on the offensive, we retreat and we lose ground and territory, and then the culture of the world overwhelms the culture of the of, 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 the, of the kingdom of God in the church. So that's why we must take the culture of the, of, the, of the kingdom of God from the four walls of the church and impose that culture of righteousness, that culture of holiness, that culture of the value system, of the righteous value system to go and advance them in the system of the world and um, causing the old world to bow down before the master. So, uh, you know, you sh if we are going to be more afraid if we are going to be more afraid of, uh, you know, how difficult it is to confront principalities and power, if we are going to be more afraid of how difficult it is to, uh, you know, to change the spheres of influence, then, uh, you know, then, you know, we are not, we are not believing God. We believe more in fear than in God. It means that fear is controlling our lives. It means that we are not believers because believers should believe God. Believers should follow God's instruction. Believers should believe that God is with them. And if God is with us, is greater is he that is in us than, in, than he that is in the world. That we can do more for God uh, than, you know, than, uh, than, than you, know, you, you know, we can do more with God than the, the world can do against us. There is no way the world can uh, conquer us if we, do, you know, if we follow God and we, we obey him and we believe in him. So, so we, sh we shouldn't be afraid of the challenges that you face when you get to your promised land. Now, there is an algorithm of what to do when you get to your promised land. And uh, I want to give you that algorithm from the scriptures, from the Bible. Because the first, you know, everything that happened in the Old Testament is a picture of things to come. All things that happen in the Old Testament is... Uh, the Bible say is an example to us. It's a shadow of things to come. So Old Testament is a lesson for people in the New Testament. But there it happened in the physical world. But here in the uh, it's like a symbol, like an example. But here in the New Testament, the real thing is it, supposed to happen. We are supposed to look into those examples: how God treated people, how God treated Israel, and as people of God, we are supposed to know how we are supposed, how He wants us to behave as well. We, okay, in the New Testament, we see in the Old Testament, we see that God, through the children of Israel, took territories. That is a symbol to us that just like children of Israel took territories, took nations, subdued nations, that is how every believer is supposed to be subduing nations also. So if the children of Israel you, you, you took territories, took nations, took, you know, subdued nations in the physical, they took over nations in the physical, they, they went to war, they, you know, conquered nations. It's a symbol for us. It's a symbolism for us that we too, we should go to war to take back territories. Each one of us has a territory that he has to take back for God. 
But instead of going to war in physical and, you know, fighting with physical weapons, we are supposed to go to war by the war of faith. Our fight is a fight of faith. And, you know, by a spiritual fight, we, we go and uh, to war and take the territory. So what are the principles? What are the instructions that God gave to Israel to take back territories uh, in the Old Testament? Let's, uh, I'm going to read from Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 12. Deuteronomy 12 from verses 1 to 7. That scripture uh, tells us what God, I mean, shows us what God uh, gave as instruction to the children of Israel, which is very crucial for us to us today. If we are going to take territories back to God today, we must do. We must uh, as well, you know, uh, study the instruction that was given to them that enabled the children of Israel to be able to exchange and take their promised lands for God. Okay, the Deuteronomy 12 says from verse one. These are the statutes and judgments which you shall be careful to observe in the land which the Lord thy God, your Father, is giving to you to possess. So God is giving you a land to possess. God is giving me a land to possess. And he says, when you get to that land, before you get to the land, but with the land that God is giving you to possess, you, there must be statutes and judgments. This is one of the most important things you have to do when you get to that to, the, to your land of promise. They are, you must know that you are coming there to bring about God's standards, God's statutes, God's you know, rules, God's uh, procedures. So, for example, let's say you, uh, you became the director of a television station in your country, the national television you must first of all find out what are the you must observe the practices of course you have gotten ready i told you already what to do before you come before you come there you have prepared yourself you got you have your plans you have your solutions all that but even when you get to the place itself you just take your time not in order for you not to be overwhelmed just take your time to observe what is happening observe what is happening and study what are the practices that are there? So make sure you note all the wrong practices, all the things that are, being, that are done the wrong way, and then come up with your own solution, come up with your own instructions, come up with your own uh, procedures, rules, commandments, statutes that are according to the standards of the kingdom of God. Now, that doesn't mean you are going to be writing Hallelujah, Amen, in Jesus' name, the uh, Deuteronomy chapter something, or the Acts of the Apostles, John the Baptist. No, no, no. You don't need to be religious about it. But you bring out the values, the value system. You bring out the, 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 the core values, the lessons, you, and you put it in the, in, the, in, the, in the contemporary language. Or in a secular language that the profession, in a professional language that the people there can observe. Like for example, the idea of the Ten Commandments is for all of us. So what you could do with that idea is to take, to make sure that you have your own Ten Commandments for your promised land. So once you get to a place of influence, develop your own Ten Commandments. You might call it golden rules. You might call it uh, you know, ten commandments. You might call it ten golden rules or twenty golden. Rules. So just rules that people are supposed to follow. But or you can you might call it value system, or you might call it uh, you know mission statement. So the idea of mission statement really is supposed to reflect the value of the company or the nation or the you know. So values you know the mission statement. So that place where are, you are supposed to have mission statement is supposed to be where you place your values. The value that of the kingdom of God. So every mission statement is supposed to reflect the kingdom of God. So everybody in your company or in your sphere of influence know that this is our mission statement. This is our value system. This is where we are moving forward towards. And for example, one, one of your or code of conduct. Yeah, that is Kike is telling me. Code of conduct. So you can have you know, you, you work out your own rule or code of conduct. For example, when that our mayor 
came to the uh, to the to the to become the mayor of the city to become the governor of the federal capital territory, he came up with some rules. One of the rules was he discovered he knew that when he discovered that when the people they was they were having in all government offices and government parastatus, they were having kiosks or, or stores. Stores where they were selling all kind of uh, candy and things, but also drinks and vodka and beer and, you know, just stores, just like, you know, supermarkets and things. So one of the things, he, one of the rules in, in the Code of Conduct is that in every government parastatus, there must not be yeah, no, no alcoholic drink must be sold. So that was one of the rules, the, one of the things that he, is one of the rule of conduct. So can you imagine that in all government, government buildings and government uh, agencies and departments, there would not be anything alcoholic. That, is, that already brings the presence of the kingdom of God big time. Because what they would normally do is that uh, those government functionaries and uh, workers on the on weekends they always have parties on weekends, <laughs> and uh, you know, especially and also on birthdays when people have their birthdays they always have parties and parties means the, the alcohol discotheque nightclubs you know so he also banned all kind of parties in government offices. So that is one, one, one of the rules he put in place, code of conduct. The other code of conduct is that you should, nobody should receive any gift to stop bribery. No gift, nobody must, you receive any gift as a government worker. You don't have the right to receive any gift. Any gift you receive, even if it's an envelope, you must create, or some people will give you gifts anyway, you must create a museum in your department or a, a room where you store and you put, you register all the gifts, even if it's envelopes or money, anything that they give you, you must register it so there is somebody in every office that is registering every gift that is brought. And if you are caught that the, if the gift was given to you or brought to your office or brought to the government uh, and it was not put in the museum, you go to jail. So these are some of the things that, so, and also another thing is that you sh nobody should smoke or drink, of course, in any of the government premises. So these are new rules that you establish, that you enforce. You don't tell them that these are kingdom of God or something, but you use arguments that every human being can understand, that normal people can understand. So you say your, your, your mission statement, for example, could say, you want to build an organization where efficiency will be the order of the day. Or you want to build an organization where there will be no corruption and it will, that will be transparent. So on that, that mission statement, then you come with your code of conduct. And that code of conduct, that's where you put all those things. So there were many things that he did. For example, one of the things that he did was that he said, if you, as a government worker, want to use a foreign car or Mercedes-Benz or foreign expensive cars, you must prove to us where you got the money from. Otherwise, you must only use local, you know, local cars. So those are, if, so, so if, because people cannot prove where they got the money from, <laughs> they have to begin to take to public transport. <laughs> So a lot of things, so those are some of the things that you, but every one of us, we have to, for example, if you are called to the world of entertainment in Nigeria, for example, I'm going to teach people because when I look at Hollywood films from Nigeria, I know there is a need for somebody, a son of the kingdom, to enter into that promised land, into that territory, into that mountain, to climb that mountain and make this kind of, bring the kingdom order and the Kingdom Reformation. And because when I watch uh, Hollywood or uh, Nollywood films, I have the impression that, you know, Nigeria is just a country of idol worshippers. That is the kind of impression you have. Mm -hmm. But almost there is no Nollywood film that doesn't have some occultic or uh, witchcraft, 
scenario in there. In there. So, for example, if somebody comes with that order, he must have to say, no Nollywood film, no film must glorify or must portray, you know, this uh, occultic and, and uh, diabolical things. So you put, all, you know, you put value system in place. For example, for Hollywood or television, for example, I would have said, let's take our uh, national anthem and find out the core value system of our country. So, you know, Nigeria, we, uh, you know, arise or compatriot. So that's say arise or compatriot. So let every Nollywood film be geared towards that value of causing our people to arise as compatriots. So that, so every film, they will be playing and joking and making film, but it will be passing a message of proactiveness to our people. It will be passing a message and communicating patriotism to our people. Arise or come back Nigeria, it's going to be, you know, that, that obey means people should, you know, you know, respond to, to any need that the country might have. So that is the kind of message those films and those entertainment world music should be passing across. Not just this kind of, you know, empty, you know, you know, frivolous lifestyle that they are propagating right now. So that is what it means for Christians to go and take, to go to their promised land. For example, I'm seeing Nkem here, Nkem DK. She is making cakes. The cakes is one of the things that she does. So if you are making cake, you have to think and say, okay, what are the culture that exists in the cake industry? Or what are the uh, values that this cake industry communicates? And you have to study it. What are the right value system from the, okay, for example, people who communicate, who, who bake cake, if you, okay, I'm not here to offend you or to like, accuse you, just, I, just saw your, I just saw your name, so I wanted to use, you know, to use cake as an example. So most of the time, we see that the content of the cake people make is not very healthy. And you see that the culture that promotes eating of cake all the time could lead to obesity or could lead to, you know, high blood, huh? high blood, sugar. High blood, high blood sugar, high blood, yeah, blood, no, what do you call it? Yeah, diabetes. diabetes. So, so what, so if I am called to that world of baking cake and that's my industry and that's my business, or maybe some people bake cake with dirty hands, or maybe some people bake cake with, you know, unhealthy or, on uh, hygienic in hygienic on uh, in, uh, in hygienic atmosphere or something like that. So you want to study what are the challenges. I don't know the industry of cake baking, so I don't know the things that are there. But you might you you know the industry, and you might want to study it and see what are the challenges that are there, and then come up with a, a list of the challenges in the bake I mean, cake baking industry that nobody is talking about and nobody is paying attention to. And then say, okay, how can we correct those things? So if cake is having, let's say, let's say one cake is having, let's say, 50 cubes of sugar. Okay, we could say, what, what are the alternatives that we could find to make cake delicious, but without all these cubes of sugar? So we could find alternatives and say, okay, we could use uh, fruits. Fruits could make the cake delicious. So, or we could find other things that are not dangerous to the health of people and to the health of children. So that way, you will now be propagating a new form of cake industry that is like not just sweet cake, but it's like healthy cake or hygienic cake or what the organic cake or cake for your health or whatever it is. So, uh, you know, and, and that, okay, let's, say, let's keep on talking about cake. How can you use cake to promote the kingdom of God, the kingdom industry, our uh, kingdom of God, the value of the kingdom of God? First of all, when every cake is normally wrapped up in some paper or package or something like that, why don't you put a scripture or have some scriptures like blessing scriptures or promises and put in every cake that you make? Or if you are having massive production or industrial production of cake, 
you buy half, uh, maybe five or ten kind, different kind of scriptures that you use as your motto, as your slogan, as your own, you know, as your inscription, or just wishing your people well. Just like, for example, I used to go to, uh, I used to go to Chinese restaurant a lot. I like Chinese food. And when you, while you are sitting waiting for your main dish or after you're eating, they bring you some candies. And when you open the candy, you see a paper inside, some paper inside. And everybody is excited about those papers. Oh, what is your own saying? What's your own saying? Oh, what's your own saying? But, it does, but we could do the same thing. Why should Chinese be bringing their own values and their own religion to come and influence us and impose on us to make us even to believe their own religious, relig you know, religious system, value system. They are using that way to, popul to popularize their value system. They are using those, you know, you know, wishes and those papers to propagate their value system. We can do the same thing. Everything you are producing, you can make sure that people will have some scriptures or some prayers or some wishes. That way we are propagating and promoting the kingdom of God through what you are doing. So everything we do in wherever we are, we, the, our, our main occupation is to think of means of bringing forth the value system, the value of God, and <coughs> establishing it as a rule. So what this scripture tells us, what this uh, scripture tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 12 is that there must be status. And statuses are things that are established. So when you come to that sphere of influence or to that your mountain, you must establish them as mission statements, as code of conduct. They must be status. And this status must be established in such a way that you tell them that anybody that removes, that they should not be removed. They must be like law, like constitutions. Status are like laws. They are like constitutions. So make sure that you come with rules. You come with value systems that will be established. So much that after you are gone from that industry or from that position, you have so much put things in order, you have so much put a structure in place that will now be guiding the destiny of that industry. You know, that those rules you have brought, those codes of conduct you have brought, those golden rules that you have brought, those mission statements that are godly, that are reflecting the kingdom of God, those things now are supposed to be guiding all the next generation of people that are going to come into that industry. So you put an order in place, you put a statue in place, you put a rule in place, you put some concepts in place, and these concepts, they are the things that keep on promoting the kingdom of God even when you are not there. They keep on promoting the kingdom of God even after you are dead. You put a rule and some rule and statutes in place to establish. That is what it means to bring the glory of the earth to God. That's what it means to subdue a sphere of life to, to, to God. And that's what Jesus was saying when he said, uh, go and uh, make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe. You see, the way to, to teach them to observe could be through the, through the mission statement. Because they are observing it. They are observing the principles of the kingdom of God through the mission statement. Everybody must live according to the mission statement of the company. Everybody must live according to the mission statement of the industry. So, since you are following the wisdom, I mean, the, 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 the mission statement, it means everybody, Christian, non-Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, everybody, they are reflecting that mission statement. Even when they go to their country, they take the mission statement of that country, to their, of that company to their countries, and they are there by observing to everything that Jesus has taught us. That is what it means. Or when you put code of conduct in place, those things reflect the kingdom values. So those are the things Jesus is saying. Go and teach them to observe. We need wisdom to pass across the things that Jesus has taught us and we teach them in a way that is in the language of the profession we are going to, the language of that sphere of influence. And when we put the code of conduct in place and people know that it's the code of conduct of our company, it is the rule of our company. It is the, you know, it is the order of this company. These are the rules. These are the, these are the rules of this company. These are the con co code of conduct of the company. But they don't know that we have actually, those code of, code, code of conduct are actually rules of our commandments or, you know, value system of the kingdom of God that we have inculcated and transformed into those rules or into those constitutions or into those mission statements or into those statutes. 
So, so they are adopting those statutes, they are adopting those value systems without even knowing. So we are compelling the whole world to live according to the standard of the of the, of the word of God, to the to live according to the values of the kingdom of God without even them knowing it. But by the time they begin to live like that, they don't smoke, they don't drink, they don't, you know, you know, say ugly words or bad words, you know, they don't curse, and they don't know what has happened to them. They have changed. So we are bringing the rule of, 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 of the kingdom of God to everywhere we are. That is how we bring the kingdom of God. And then when we have the opportunity, you know, we make them to read those prayers. We make them to read those scriptures and Holy Spirit will begin to work on them. Of course, this is separate from, you know, ministering to them, uh, like evangelizing them to get to give their lives. But apart from giving their lives, we are changing structures. We are changing institutions. We are changing lifestyle. We are changing, uh, you know, the environment. We are changing the, the conduct of the people, the rules of conduct, how people rule, make, live their lives. That is what Jesus was paying attention to when he said, go and make disciples, teach them to observe. The goal is to cause people, unbelievers, to observe the values of the kingdom of God. That is the goal. Even when you are going to a restaurant, the Chinese want you to observe their values by giving you those scriptures. Why are Christian restaurants not doing that? We just want to go and shout hallelujah. That is the problem. We are not using wisdom. We just want to go and convert people immediately. No, let's send the word first. Let's, you know, go and do like Jesus said first. And what Jesus said is that go and teach them to observe. Just anyhow you could find to teach them. Go and teach them to observe. And also another way you could teach people in your industry to observe the principles of the, uh, to observe the, the things that Jesus has taught us, the value system of the kingdom, is by organizing, okay, you might, okay, for example, somebody in our church here, every church, every business that is started in our church or every person that became, okay, let's say, let, let's say that mayor, he became the, the mayor of the city. He had, he had 100,000 government workers under him, 100,000, just in his, under him alone. So the, the idea is that all these people that are under you, they have to be going for training, professional training. Just like companies have their own professional trainings, that, that is one of the ways also you could teach everybody, the whole country, to observe what God has taught us. So you have professional training, but in that professional training, you also have trainings on values, trainings on principles, trainings on the mission statement of the company, trainings on the code of conduct of the, com of the company, trainings on the, the new order, how things are supposed to be. So you have coaches, you have life coaches, and the things they will be teaching will be standards of the kingdom of God, not just professional stuff, but inner stuff, you know, value system. You'll be training them, and also you'll be, you know, you, you, you know just like the Japanese clubs do, and uh, South Korean club, you cause them to pray. And one of the prayers should be prayer of accepting Christ into their hearts. You know, so these are some of the things that you are, so, this is one of the sure ways that we bring the kingdom of God into wherever we are. We, you know, it's a way to penetrate the whole world with the values of the kingdom of God. So if we keep on reading this scripture, Deuteronomy 12, it says we should establish status and rules that people should observe. Then verse 2 says, you shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations which you shall possess serve their gods. That's what I meant in the beginning when I say, find out all the things that are doing, being done wrong. Find out the, 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 uh, the, 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 the things that have been established, the institutions that have been established that are not glorifying God that are not promoting the right value system. Find out all those things that are promoting the wrong value system. Find them out and bring them down. Change the rules. Bring down the, the wrong value system. Dispossess them. You know, dispossess them of the... You know. So that is the whole idea of going to take, to take over, you know, territories for God. So find out the high mountains. High mountains is where people are using to worship their gods. And the hills and under the green trees, find out where va the wrong value systems are hidden. Find out where the wrong practices are hidden. Find, find out what are the things people are doing in those places that are actually worshipping, you know, you know, the wrong, the wrong, the wrong 
our values and uh, that are following the wrong value system. So God says that you should go and replace them with the right value systems. Then verse 5, but you shall seek the place where the Lord your God chooses out of all your tribes to put his name for his dwelling place. And there you shall go. So we have to also find our ways, uh, we also have to find our ways to uh, bring the name of God forward. So, you know, maybe we say, okay, we institute prayers or we institute scripture readings or we, we, give, give, we give gifts to people, you know, that reflect the name of God or prayers or something like that. There you shall burn offering, your sacrifice, or your tithe, your eve of, or you invite, you know, ministers or you invite pastors to pray or to share scriptures or to share principles. So these are some of the ways that we could use to bring the presence of the kingdom of God. But the most important thing is that anything we start to do, we don't just do them secretly, underground, or once in a while. We must turn them to rules. We must turn them to statutes. We must turn them to constitution. We must turn them to con rule of conduct. We must turn them to code of conduct. We must turn them, turn them to vision statement. We must turn them to golden rules. We mu they must become principles. They must become uh, 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 no, no structures. They must be built into the structure. Anything that we are doing. And verse 7 says, And there you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice in all that which he has put your hand to do you and your household in which the Lord your God has blessed you. So the purpose of all this is that you put the order of God, the rule of God, so that the people of God will rejoice in the land. They will not serve the, the wrong God, but they will serve the Lord God Almighty.